This morning, I, I thought I would just talk a little bit about some things that are happening. A lot of, every once in a while, we like to have like a current events. You remember in school, we used to have current events? <laughs> current events. And, and you know, we're blessed. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're blessed. Because if your hope is in what's going on <laughs> elsewhere, you'd be in big trouble. Paul said, uh, if in this life only I have hope, I am all, of all men most miserable. Okay, now, I, when, when I was coming up, and, uh, you know, I came up in a time when everybody thought that the government was going to round up all the hippies and throw them in concentration camp. How many people? <laughs> okay. Well, they didn't do that, so now they're saying they're going to round up all the Christians and throw them in concentration <laughs> They must the ones they didn't use for the hippies, I guess, are going to use for the But listen, <clears throat> that kind of stuff is kind of crazy. But listen, stuff is going on in this world and in our nation that it is crazy. Okay. Do you know, now, I've, I've, I've mentioned some of this before. I'm not saying this stuff to get people riled up, okay? And I'm not, you know, this is an election year. We have an election coming up, and there are people on both sides very passionate about what they feel about certain things. I'm not into campaigning or politicizing. I'm, I'm not into that. But there's been things that's going on in our nation. Do you know they're chipping away at our liberties slowly, brick by brick? And not just this administration. It's been going on for a long time. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, just recently, and I said some of these things, and some of you might watch some of my YouTube videos, but I, I, I said, you know, uh, right now, chaplains in the United States Army, if their commander commands them, they can't end a prayer with, in the name of Jesus. And certainly, they can't do it. Uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, we all know the story about Obamacare is going to try to force uh, religious organizations to uh, supply birth control and abortion services and so forth. And, of course, the Catholic Church doesn't believe in any of that. And they're trying to say, well, you know, what you do on Sunday morning is your business, but the rest of the time, you know, we're the government. We're telling you what to do, okay? And that's, and that's happening. And then I heard this. Some of you guys might have heard this story, and it's kind of silly, but it's not. Uh, I guess down in, I think it was in either North Carolina or South Carolina. Did, did you know they have lunchbox police in schools? This girl, this, 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 her mom uh, made her a lunch to take to school, and she made her like a turkey sandwich and a thing of apple juice and uh, some potato chips or something. And, and the, uh, they have lunchbox inspectors, and they found out that she didn't have any vegetables, so, they made, so you know what they did? They made her buy what the cafeteria was serving. You know what they were serving that day? Chicken nuggets. <laughs> health, you know, health food. But here's the thing, and they sent the bill to the mom. Okay, so now what's happening, that's kind of funny, but what's happening is, it's getting to the point where the government, it wants to tell you what to do. Okay, now I'm not trying to get you riled up, please, don't, I don't want, I don't want, to, I'm not ready to have a riot. Because see, here's the thing, when these things start to happen, yeah, you know, and you hear about these things, my tendency when I hear about this stuff is I get mad. I get like, Mur. but you know what, we ought to get excited. Because it means when this stuff starts happening, that means we're all the closer to the time when Jesus is, co is coming back. Because he says, when you see these things happen, look up for your redemption draws not. Okay, so now what happens now with, with government? And this, ha this has been happening for centuries, for millennia, that, you know, God has ordained human government. He has, you know, he, he, has, he has ordained a government of nations. And, and for the main purpose of keeping order and keeping law and order and, and so forth. But what happens is when a, when a man or a woman or a human being who's created in the image of God has no fear of God and they get in a position of leadership, they start thinking that they're God, okay? And that's been going on for a long time. And this, this morning, I, I, wanted to just, I just want to read a couple passages of Scripture to, to let you understand that what's happening today isn't anything new. It's really the way of all flesh. And I, I'm not saying this to get you mad or to get you scared. I'm saying this to get you excited. Because, you know, Jesus said these things would happen. But I want you to look at a couple passages of Scripture with me <clears throat> this morning, just briefly. I want you, if we want to find out about what this is all about, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning. To Genesis chapter 10. Let's start there, okay? <laughs> and uh, if you turn to Genesis chapter 10, you'll find a lot of... Uh, Begats, you know, the sons of so forth and so forth. It's a genealogy. We're not really going to read through the whole genealogy because it's kind of irrelevant, but I do want you to turn to verse 8. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. They're rehearsing here the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Noah had three sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. They were the three sons of Noah. And... Uh, it says, 
Well, in verse 6, it says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizram, and Fut. Fut. Okay. I might not be pronouncing it. And it says in verse 8. Look at verse 8. And Cush, who is one of the sons of Ham, Cush begat Nimrod. You see that name there, Nimrod? Nimrod? Nimrod, the name means rebellion. Okay? It means revolt. That's what the name means. Cush begat Nimrod. And it says, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. And Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Ashur and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and so forth. So what this is telling us is that Cush had a son named Nimrod. And it says here, he began to be a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, if you, if you would begin to read about the linguistics here, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but there are books that have been written explaining these things. And it says he was a mighty hunter. The implication here is Nimrod began, this is after the flood, okay? Uh, and, and Nimrod began to be looked upon as being a mighty man. He's like the first hero, Okay? Now, we all know we have heroes. We have idols, you know, American Idol and sports heroes and people we look up to. Well, well, Nimrod became one of the first uh, individuals. He was the first individual that people begin to look to as being superior than everybody else because he was a mighty hunter. And it says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, that that word before is a Hebrew word, panim, and it actually means in the face of, okay? And some people might read that and say, well, you know... uh, Nimrod was in the presence of God. No, it meant that Nimrod got in God's face. He was, he was lifting himself up. He was created in God's image, but he had no fear of God. And he began to lift himself up, and the people began to look at him and, and lift him up as being their, their leader. They began to exalt him, okay? Now, that's a beginning. Now, turn over to chapter 11, okay? Now we, now, we read that, that Nimrod, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And, you know, if you were like me when we grew up, they taught us that the cradle of civilization was where? Mesopotamia, which is today Iraq and Iran and that part of the world. Where was Babylon? Where was Babel? Right there. The ruins are there. Uh, Saddam Hussein wanted to rebuild the ruins and make himself like a new Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Uh, but he didn't last too long. But the thing is, it's the... the, 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 the the ruins are there, right there, in, this, in the cradle of civilization. Now, here's what it says. Verse 1 of chapter 11. <laughs> and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Some of us, when we, we did a study in the book of Genesis, some of you were here when we read this, uh, it says, It came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, which would be right in where Iraq is today. Now, God had given a commandment to the sons of Noah. He says, I want you, you know, after the flood and after they left the ark, he said, I want you to go in, out into the earth and populate, replenish the earth. Go, go apart from each other and settle all over the world and have kids and have families and, you know, populate the earth, civilize the earth, right? But instead... We read here that they, or most of them, or a large part of them, they decided, well, you know, maybe it's better if we stay together. There's safety in numbers, you know. Maybe it's better if we decide to stay together. And there's this guy named Nimrod, who's a great hunter. He'll protect us from the animals. And he's our leader. And he began to be lifted up. Do you know that every form of human mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Egyptian, has its roots with Nimrod? It has its roots in these stories? Okay. Let's read a little bit. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east, in verse 2, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us make us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered or brought upon the face of the earth. So the intent of these people under the direction of Nimrod, was to establish a kingdom, a government, a city, where they would be in control apart from subservience to God. 
They were created in God's image, but they had no fear of God. So they began to lift themselves up. Especially Nimrod began to lift him up as a god. So they said, let's build us a tower. We're going to build us this big tower. It's going to reach to heaven. And we'll be our own gods. So they began to work. They began to build this tower. They didn't want to be scattered all over the earth and replenish the earth like God had told them to. They felt safe and secure with their, with their king, Nimrod, their, their god, king, their hero. They're going to build this city. They're going to build this tower, and everything's going to be fine. And who needs God? This is what basically they're saying today. You know, the government's saying, keep God in your church on Sunday morning. The rest of the time, you're ours. Okay? Who needs God? So they started building this city. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people was one, and they have all have one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You know, man is a very creative creature. Human beings have been able to land men on the moon. We're, we're able to do, you know, we have such a great intelligence and great ability because we reflect the image of God in us. So he, he gifted us with all these gifts and talents and abilities. And we're able to understand abstract thoughts and do uh, mathematical formula to figure things out. Even in the ancients, they were able to figure things out without calculators. Okay, You remember when you were in school and you didn't have a calculator? <laughs> you had to figure out with a pencil and paper. Now I think all they, they have calculators. But they didn't have them back then, but they were able to build pyramids and towers. And here, we're, you know, they're doing this, and God's saying, you know what? We told them to go into all the ends of the earth and replenish the earth, the Father, Son, and Spirit. When it talks in the plural, there's only one God and three persons, right? And they're saying, well, you know, what are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. If we let them go, they'll be able to do anything they want to. And eventually, and again, the implication here is eventually God said, we're going to have to judge them. God says, I'm going to have to judge them. If I let them go the way they're doing, I'm going to have to judge them, just like I did before the flood. So it says in verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad. They wouldn't do what God told them to do, so what, what happened? He made every one of them speak a different language. Some of you might say, what language were they speaking at first? I don't know. But I know this much, when God got done with them, they wasn't understanding each other. So they went to all the different parts of the earth and populated the earth like God told them to. Okay. It doesn't say that God destroyed the, statue, or, uh, the, uh, the tower. It didn't destroy the tower. In fact, they went on to build the city of Babylon. It says here uh, in verse 8, The Lord scattered them abroad and thence from the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord there did confound. The word Babel means confounding. The word there did confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So we see here the beginning of this city is called Babel here, but we know in the Greek translation is the word Babylon. Babylon. How many have heard? You've heard the city of Babylon, okay? <laughs> now, I want you to turn with me. So, so we see what's happening. I want you to get the picture. We see a man who has been deified trying to establish a kingdom apart from worship of God. Apart from God's will, okay? Now turn with me over again, and, and, and we're just going to skirt through a few passages here. Look to the prophet Daniel, uh, the prophet Daniel. And uh, we want to look at Daniel chapter 3. I could spend a lot of time in Daniel, but I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, I know it's in here somewhere. Okay. Daniel chapter 3. <laughs> now, just, just to uh, summarize the story of Daniel. This is, this is a thousand years later after what we read, at least a thousand years after what we read in Genesis. We know that the children of Israel have been taken captive by the nation of Babylon. They had fallen into idolatry, and God warned them and told them, listen, you better turn back to me, you better start worshiping me, or I'm going to send somebody to take you to, to destroy your city. Uh, at this time, the, the city of Babylon the, uh, was, the, was, the big, was the big gun in the world. They were like the power. Uh, they had a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. This is, a, this is established historically uh, 
uh, you know, archaeological finds have, uh, have agreed with all these things in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He went and conquered uh, the known world at that time. He went and conquered Jerusalem and, and brought the, the, the first time he conquered Jerusalem, he took some of the youngest men from Jerusalem, took them back to Babylon and tried to uh, make them into good Babylonians. Okay, he tried to, he changed their names, he changed their, uh, tried to teach them, tried to change what they ate and so forth. And, and there's a lot in Daniel chapter 1 and 2 about how Daniel wouldn't eat the king's food. He didn't want himself to be defiled with the king's food and so forth and how he stood uh, for the, you know, for the truth and so forth. But look at, look at chapter 3. And so we can understand the nature of human government, all right? Chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, if, if you read chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this statue, and Daniel gave him the interpretation of the dream. And the statue represented in the dream all the, all the powers of the world that had anything to do with Israel, the world powers, starting with Babylon and ending with, I believe, the, the last time's uh, government. Okay, But... So after having that dream, Nebuchadnezzar went out and he figured, okay. So he built this statue. And listen to what it says. The Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of all the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which he had set up. (laughs) Verse 3. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the counselors, and all them, okay, uh, They were gathered together at the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And they stood before the image that he set up, verse 4. Then the herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sacred, psaltery, dulcimer, and when the music starts, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Now look at what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. He's commanding his people to worship the image that he set up representing his kingdom. Do you see any, I mean, do you understand what I'm getting at? That what's going on today in this world is nothing new. Mankind has been trying to govern this world without God since the very beginning. And they've done so trying to give the people something to worship other than the Most High. So they built statues and they they built buildings and they built uh, kingdoms and, and people were supposed to bow down and worship. We're supposed to be awestruck because the government has passed a law or the king has given an edict or the president has given a command. And we're supposed to say, and we're supposed to set aside everything we believe to be true and bow down and worship the government. Do you know in the Roman Empire, the, the, the very early days of the Roman or the early days of the church in the Roman Empire, the Romans didn't care. You could worship anybody or anything you wanted to as long as once a year, you would bow down to the emperor. Every, every citizen in, in, in the Roman provinces were commanded that every year, once in a while, they would come along and they would set up an image representing the Roman emperor, and they would have to bow down. If you did that, you could, do, you could worship anything or anybody. Well, the Christians couldn't do that. So we can't bow down to your idol. We can't bow down to the emperor. And then, so what happened? So they end up getting thrown to the lions in the, in the Colosseum. They would not. But you, but you know what happened in the early Roman Empire? Christianity spread like wildfire. Even, even in the midst of persecution. You know what I found out? And if you look at history, when, when the persecution comes, the word of God begins to flow. God's miracles begin to flow. People begin to say, listen, I know, listen, I know what, the, what they're trying to do. They're trying to get me to worship them. See, people want to set up government as God. And get us to worship. And say, okay, you can have your church, go to church, pray to Jesus, sing songs, do all that you want to do. Just bow down to the emperor. And say, okay. And we'll let you do anything you want. This is what Nebuchadnezzar. And we know the story. We're not going to read the whole story. The three Hebrew boys, they refused to bow down. And Nebuchadnezzar threw them in the fiery furnace and they came out. Didn't even smell like smoke. God was with them, all right? But see, here's the thing. And, And Nebuchadnezzar ended up, you know what? He ended up getting saved. He had to go insane for seven years. But when he came out of it, he said, there's, there's only one God in heaven. <laughs> the Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the most, most idolatrous nation on the face of the earth, came around to believe in, in the God of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the God of the Old Testament. 
took, took him to go crazy for seven years. But that's what happened. But thank God for guys like Daniel who, who stood their ground. And these three Hebrew boys who would not bow down to the idol. Now somebody's going to say, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. That's like, that happened way back then. We don't have any idols now. We're not being commanded to bow down. Well, you know what? Think about this for a minute. All the totalitarian governments in the last century, what's the first thing they did? They would try to eliminate Christianity. Soviet Russia, while the... While the uh, I was reading and I heard people talking about when, the, when the, uh, the, the leaders of the church in Russia were arguing about, you know, how much money they would make and what color their vestments would be. The communists were taken over a couple years later. They didn't have to worry anymore about what they were paying because they were gone. China, today China, uh, you know, people meet underground and you know, uh, Christians meet underground in cellars and in caves. And, 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 and the church is growing leaps and bounds in China. But they're persecuted. In, in uh, just recently, the, the leader of uh, North Korea was killed. They counted him as a, as, as a god. He died, Kim Jong-il. They thought he was a god and treated him as such. He was starving his people to death, but he was set up as a god. All these totalitarian governments begin by eliminating any possibility of worshiping any other god and setting up themselves or something else to be looked to and worshiped, okay? Now, I don't know if I'm losing anybody. I don't want to lose you. I want you to understand what's going on, all right? Now, these, that's all Old Testament stuff. Okay, but I want you to look at something else now. We're going to look at a passage. A couple months ago, I preached out of Revelation chapter 13. Turn there with me, and we want to look at that again. Now, Revelation chapter 13, that's in the future, okay? And we're going to see what goes on there. Look at chapter 13. Now, look, look at this. The, the Apostle John got this vision, and he said in verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, we could spend a lot of time, you know, reconciling Revelation with the prophet Daniel and some of the visions he had, okay, and we've, we've done that, but I just, I just want you to see this. We're, we're really skipping through here without, we're passing up a lot of stuff, but look at verse 2. And the beast which I saw, now, now John is seeing this in a vision. He's on the Isle of Patmos. This is about 90 years, or maybe about 60 years after Christ was crucified, and uh, he, this is one of the last books, probably the last book written in the New Testament. He said, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. If you would check this out, these, these different allusions to different animals go all the way back to Daniel's vision of the, of the kingdoms of the world. Okay, So these are kingdoms he's talking about. And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped, listen, verse 4, they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. We're in a time right now where we see the leaders and the kingdoms of this world attempting to take the place of God and demanding worship of, his, of, of, of their subjects. They want us to worship it. They might not be setting up a golden statue to bow down to, but everything else. And listen, it has nothing to do with Democrat or Republican. This administration, other administrations, they've all, they've all pulled this, this on us. They've all presented us with, with stuff that we're supposed to be so awestruck with just keep your religion in church on Sunday morning. Okay? Listen to what it says. We're going to read this. Verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Can't fight City Hall, can you? Okay. Verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. It's three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Do you hear what some of our leaders are saying? Do you hear what some of, some of the, the people in our government say about Christians and about God? They blaspheme the Lord our God. Leaders from other nations will openly blaspheme God, make a mockery of the faith, because worship of the living God is contrary to people created in his image that don't fear his name. Okay, reading a little bit more. Uh, verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall 
worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I preached the message back in November. Is your name written in the lamb's book of life? Who is your king today? If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Okay? So that's the first beast that he saw. And again, I'm really just brushing through this. That's the first beast he saw. That first beast, I believe, represents the system. I say, what system? Democracy? Theocracy? Uh, you know, kingdoms? What? Man's system. Because you could talk about democracy. You can talk about communism. You can talk about uh, theocracy. You can talk about any kind of ocracy that you want. If God's not in it, it's man's system. If God's not in it, it's a false God. If there are leaders who were created in the image of God and they have no fear of God, every form of human government will eventually deteriorate into anarchy. We're seeing it happen. We've seen it happen. Okay, that's the system. Now listen to what he says in verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now listen, there's, there's a, a concerted effort in the spiritual realm to get you to take your eyes off God and put it on man. Everything, political, entertainment, uh, economic, but whatever, religion, everything, everything is Satan is orchestrating. You know, people say, is this a conspiracy theory? It's a conspiracy. It has been going on since before the beginning of time. Because you know what Satan did. You know what his name was before. He, when he was first created, his name was what? Anybody know what it is? Lucifer. The light bearer. He, the Bible tells us Satan was created to be the chief of all of God's creation. He was the worship leader in heaven. And you know what it says? He says he got to thinking, you know what? He was created beautiful. People think Satan is an ugly, Rrr. but he was created to be beautiful. And he said, you know what? I can be like God. The same lie he told Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, you know, God just, he lied to you. You can be just like God if you eat of that tree. You'd be just like him. It's the same. It hasn't changed. He hasn't changed his M.O. in all this time. And people were still falling for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Reading a little bit more. I'm getting ahead of myself. He says, he exercises all, in verse 12, all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. Oh, powerful. And deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which have, had the wound by a sword and did live. That sound familiar? Let's make an image. Let's get something we can all look at and get behind and worship. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. See, here's what, this is future, but really the seeds of it are right now. There's going to come a time when this world, this world leader who worships the system will say, listen, if you want to do business in this world, you've got to buy into my program. You've got to take the mark. Of the beast. What's that mark? I don't know what it's going to be, if it's going to be a number, if it's going to be a chip. I don't know what it's going to be. But there's going to be something that they're going to require us if we're here. I'm, I don't expect to be here because I believe in the rapture of the church. Okay, But they're going to require the people on this earth to take some kind of a, a mark or something that's going, to, that's going to allow them to participate in the business of the government. And all they have to do, you can have, there'll be churches, there'll be religion. All you got to do is just bow down to the image. Believe whatever you want. Just bow down to the image. See, that's what's happening today. Just bow down to the image. Just buy in. And I'll tell you what, you know what? Uh, maybe somebody will get mad. Evangelical Christians have bought this hook, line, and sinker. Oh, you know. And I'm, uh, I believe in voting. I believe in the political process. Thank God we live in a, in a nation that we can cast our ballots. We can cast our votes. I hope you all pray. 
about who to vote for and go cast your vote and do it as God would direct you to do it. I know some of us, we vote the same way Daddy voted for the last 55 or 60 years, okay? We need to pray and ask God, who you want me to vote for? God might say, don't vote for any of them. That's, that's his prerogative too. Okay, don't, don't keep from voting just because you're lazy. Okay, if you're just lazy and you don't want to go. Okay, but, 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 but listen, so I'm, I'm all for voting, and, and that's great. But ultimately, I don't care who wins. Ultimately, if somebody created in God's image gets in a position of power and they don't fear God, it's going to deteriorate, as it has been deteriorating for decades now. Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, it's been deteriorating, it's been breaking down for decades now. And ultimately, ultimately, here's the goal. You have your church, have your religion, go to church Sunday morning, go to church Wednesday night, we'll worship God, wave your hands. But when you walk out that door, you belong to us. When you walk out that door, bow down. Because we're in control. Now listen. I want to tell you something. When we hear that, I'm not saying this to scare people. I'm not saying this to rile people up. But I want you to read one more scripture with me, and we're going to close. Turn with me to Luke's gospel. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. And, you know, when I read this, this is the one verse that got me started on this mess. So, if, you know, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> Somebody's saying, man, what's he preaching this morning? All right. Luke chapter 13. And look at verse 31. Jesus is preaching and teaching. In Luke chapter 14 and verse 31, it says this. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees to Jesus, saying unto him, Get thee out and depart, because Herod wants to kill you. They're saying, Jesus, we know, we know about the Herods, right? The Herods were a bunch of nasty people. And there were Pharisees that came to Jesus and said, Man, you better leave. You better get back to where you came from, because Herod... Is out to kill you. We know the story about Herod. We know what he did with John the Baptist. Remember the story about John the Baptist? Herod put him in prison because John the Baptist told him that what he was doing wasn't right with his, with his sister-in-law. So Herod said, I'll take care of him. Threw him in jail and ended up cutting his head off. Right? So the Pharisees come and said, Jesus, man, you better leave. Because, you know, Herod wants to get you. Listen to what Jesus said. See, this is what I want to leave you with. See, I, I don't want to get you riled up. I don't want to get you scared, but I want you to listen to this. Jesus said, you go tell that fox. He says, you go tell him, behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day I will be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following and it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Listen, he's saying, listen, go ahead, pass your laws. Go ahead, pass your hate speech laws. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do Obamacare. Make them do whatever. Go, try to do what you want to. Jesus said, listen, the gates of hell won't prevail against my church. See, I'm going to tell you something. The more the, the, the persecution comes, the more that the government and the world tries to get us to turn our head and turn and worship idols, that's the more that the Spirit of God is going to begin working. When we run out of options, like from Washington, D.C. and Harrisburg and Greensboro, wherever it might be, when we start running out of political man-made options, that's when the power of God is going to begin to fall. So go ahead and pass law. See, I don't want, we don't need to be afraid. We need to be excited. Because when this stuff starts going down, listen, God's going to begin to move. And just like in the first century when the, when the church was growing and spreading like wildfire, when 12 men turned the world upside down under, in, the, in the midst of persecution, so we are going to see the greatest revival, I believe, before the return of Jesus Christ. I believe we're going to see an outpouring of God's Spirit. Not that the whole nation is going to get saved. Not that the, you know, the governments and everything. They're going to, the pressure is going to be on. The persecution is going to happen. But that's when we're going to see people. That's when we're going to see the fallow ground broken, brother. Whenever they run out of options. Whenever, whenever the, the only place they can turn is to look up and say, God, what are you doing? And that's when God can speak and move and show the power of his Spirit. Pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray that they get born again and saved. And get ready. Don't be afraid. You know, when you hear some of this stuff, you get mad. Look what they're doing. Don't get mad. Get glad. <laughs> get excited. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Pass a law that, uh, you know, that says I can't, there's some certain things I can't preach. And watch what I'll do. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You want to throw me in jail? I'll preach to them in jail. I don't care. I'm too old to worry about that stuff. Most of my life is behind me. <laughs> I don't care. Do what you want. 
If Jesus Christ died for me, when you read about the early martyrs, the early saints who gave their lives, I can't think of the fellow's name now. He was, he was an apostle, Polycarp, apostle of John, John the Baptist, uh, uh, apostle of the, the, uh, the apostle John, a follower of John. They, they said, renounce your faith. He said, Jesus never done nothing to me. Why should I turn my back on him? He never, done, he never did me anything but good. Jesus never did me anything but good. Why should I turn my back on him? Why should I lie about him? Government that never did me all that good. All they want to do is take my money. See, get ready, saints. I'm not saying this to rile people up to get you all excited about voting. No, we're going to vote for this one, for that one. Vote whoever God tells you to vote for. I don't care. I'm telling you this because when you see this stuff happen, Jesus said, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Time's coming. We're getting ever so closer to the return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We don't got to be afraid. We don't have to wring our hands. We don't have to throw our shoe at the TV when this stuff comes on. All we got to do is say, praise the Lord Jesus. Even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus, come back. He's on his way. He's coming back. And you know what? I want to be accounted worthy. When he comes back I want him, and he takes me up, I want him to say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Okay, that's what I want for me, and that's what I want for you all. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, make sure that you have put your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And look out and hold on, because the time's coming when you're going to need your faith. The time's coming when you're going to have to depend on God like you've never depended on him before. And you know what? My God, my, the word says I've never seen my, my seed forsaken or my seed begging for, be, for, for bread. You don't have to be afraid of what's going on in the world. As long as you're his, he's going to take care of you. As long as you're his, he's going to say, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Him. Won't you stand as we, as we close our service? It's good to be in the Lord's house. Praise the Lord. I'm glad. You know what? I'm glad I live in America. It's a good place to live. I thank God for the freedoms and liberties we have. I thank God you allow us to have these liberties longer as long as you see fit. But, Father, as we see them withering away, Father, we're looking to you, Father. We're running out of options. And Father, we're looking to you. You are the God, the true God. You are the God of this Bible. You're the only living God. You are the sovereign king. And Father, you said, you said that the gates of hell would not prevail against your church. Father, I'm not talking about a denomination or this congregation. I'm talking about the body of Christ made up of believers everywhere. Father, you said the gates of hell won't prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, we're trusting in your word. Oh, Lord, we see, we read the papers, we see the news reports, we watch the news, and we, sometimes we get so angry of the injustice. Sometimes we get so angry as we see wicked people trying to take things over, take things from us. But God, we pray for our leaders. We pray for the judges. We pray for the congressmen. Father, I pray, God, there would be a, a revival even in our government. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have our eyes fixed on you. And that, Father, you would show us your way. That you would meet all our needs according to your riches and glory. Father, the wells might dry up, but you'll never dry up. God, we give you all praise, honor, and glory. Father, as we prepare to leave this place, but not your presence. Listen, as I always say this, we're going to close in prayer. I'm going to go back and shake some hands. If you need prayer for anything, please stick around up here. We might pray with you. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask you to go with us from this place. God, let, let healing, the healing touch, Father, just touch each and every one in this place. Father, those that are recovering from sicknesses and illnesses, those who are homesick, the shut-ins, Father, I pray you are able, God. We pray for healing in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would heal in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for our loved ones who are out in the, out in the world. and out. Father, people who have been raised in church, they have turned their back on God. I pray, God, you would draw them back in with your loving kindness. So you would break up the fallow ground that the seeds of God's word would take root. Father, I pray you would be with us as we go from this place, but not your presence. Help us tell somebody about Jesus as we help us witness to somebody that we might see someone saved from hell in the precious name of Jesus Christ. He's worthy. He is Lord. For He is Lord. He is